Hello. Um, I believe we're we're about to start. Um, my name is Simran Hans, and I'm a film critic for The Observer. Welcome to this BAFTA Q&A for On the Record, which you will have seen. And as you know, is a documentary that recounts the experiences of several Black women who worked at Jeff, Def Jam Records in the 1990s. Um, and the film exposes the, the challenges and the consequences of, of speaking out publicly. There are captions available for this talk, which you can turn on the turn on at the bottom of your screen if you want to. And um, the talk will be available to watch again later. Um, so if you want to watch it again or share it on social media, um, you can do that via BAFTA's SoundCloud page after the event. Um, with us tonight, we've got directors Kirby Dick and Amy Ziering, who are award-winning investigative filmmakers whose films have directly resulted in the passage of 35 laws, five congressional hearings, major products pulled from the marketplace, and sweeping institutional changes. You may have seen their previous films, The Invisible War and The Hunting Ground. We also have one of the film's protagonists, Drew Dixon, who is a producer, writer, and silence breaker. Um, I'm going to ask them some questions about the film, but there is also an opportunity for you, the audience, to ask questions too. Unlike in a traditional non-Zoom Q&A, there's no need to keep the questions until the end, so feel free to send them in as you're watching and I will pepper them throughout, um, throughout the talk. Also want to say thanks very much to BAFTA for putting on this Q&A and the producer of the event is at JC underscore Chrissy via Twitter. Um, my first question is to the filmmakers, um, to Amy and Kirby. How did this project come about? Um, well, Kirby and I, as you said, Simran, have, have made two films already in the space of sexual assault, long before this issue was in vogue or people were even thinking or talking about it. And <clears throat> so, of course, after Me Too happened, our cell phones started exploding and everybody was wanting to talk. You know, for years we'd been begging people to talk. And so Kirby and I were actually working on a different project and we looked at each other and I said, I got to go out there and start collecting these stories. So we just started shooting really like very close to, you know, after the explosion of Me Too and filming women in all different industries and in all different walks of life, just sharing with us what their experiences had been. And one of, and, and Drew is one of those women we came across via a mutual friend. And uh, we had scheduled five days of interviews in New York. And I remember I was seeing, you know, back to back interviews. And I think Drew was like the third day and in the middle of the day. And I remember after the interview, I looked around and like three of the crew members were crying. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> there's, a, there's something here. This is like, you know, of, of, of great magnitude and important. I called Kirby that night and I said, there's this woman and I met her and she doesn't know if she wants to go on the record, but I think we should just keep following her. And that's kind of how it started. Um, Drew and I spoke last week because uh, I was interviewing her for, for Vice as well. And Drew, you mentioned that the process of filming was eight months and you didn't know whether you were gonna participate until quite late in the process. Can you talk a little bit about that decision to, um, you know, not to labor the pun in the title, but to go on the record and, and to, to kind of make that commitment to, to telling your story? Because I think one of the interesting things that the film draws out is how tortured that decision was, both to come out in the New York Times in 2017 and, and also to be part of the film. Yeah, so um, that is true. The decision to come forward has been agonizing and it was agonizing and really just by virtue of coincidence a mom in my daughter's grade knew amy and kirby and the executive producer of this film and we were talking about the me too stories that were just beginning to break at a parents event and i alluded in passing to the fact that i had a me too story of my own involving russell simmons and that's really how i met amy and kirby before i even decided to go on the record and um, they were, I, I, I agreed to go forward with them even before I decided I was gonna go on the record because I was familiar with their work. I respected their work and they were also very good about empowering me to make the choice. Ultimately, they told me that even if they filmed me for a period of time, I didn't have to agree to move forward with the documentary until much later. And so that's how we had months of footage before we had the heart to heart talk about whether or not I would move forward with the film. And by then I'd established 
trust in them. And, you know, that's, that's really how it all began. And then really went on for two years of um, documenting the before, the during and the after decision to go on the record with my story. I, I want to hear a little bit more from, from you, Amy and, and Kirk, about how you develop that trust with the survivors from, from your end, because it's a mutual relationship and you've worked with survivors before. Um, and I, I'm sure there are BAFTA members watching who are filmmakers who are interested in making documentaries themselves about these very sensitive subjects who might be interested to know how to approach their practice. Um, like you guys have? Well, I'm usually the first point of contact. Um, I was on the last two films and, and someone on this one as well with a lot of the survivors. And I guess um, the first thing I do, and as we, as Drew just mentioned, is always say, you know, whatever you decide is the right decision for you. Our, our presence and our filmmaking and our process, I don't want in any way to harm you or impede on any decision making you might be making about whether coming forward or not. And we really walk the walk on that and we really are sincere in that. We really wanna, I always say, we don't wanna do any more harm, you've gone through enough. So I think that's very important for anyone working in the trauma space, for any filmmakers out there. I mean, it's, it's completely sincere on our part and I think that's why we get the kind of interviews we get and, and form the kind of relationships we get. It's because we, we enter with a real respect and a real concern for the other person's trauma. It's not sensational, it's not exploitive. It's like, so that's one thing. So just from the get go, and as Drew said, it was really legit. I mean, when we met, she was like, you know, she talked to me on the phone, she was like, I don't know, I don't know what I'm, you know, I don't, you know, this is huge and I don't know what I wanna do and I've kept this secret for so long. And I just said, look, we'll just follow you. Don't sign a release. If you ever want us to leave, we'll leave, you know, and let's just see how it goes. And we'll both kind of evolve with that together. And we really, really sincerely meant that and we were following other people so that was how that happened and then the second thing i'll say is when i do interviews with trauma survivors the first thing i do and i also think this is really important for filmmakers to know because a lot of them don't do this is we sit down we make sure the space is very very the set is very secure and as few people as possible so it's an intimate safe space i also try and have it be not a big loft that's open and you know, intimidating, but also secure four walls, a kind of intimate space as intimate and, and, and confined, you know, so it feels comfortable for everybody. And then the second thing I do is I say to the person, if I ask you anything you don't want to ask, that's totally fine. If I ask you something and, or you feel like we need to stop, that's totally fine. If you want to end the interview at any point, 100% fine. You do you, you know, I don't want to lose any sleep tonight thinking I did anything to add to your burden. And I don't want you to lose any sleep tonight thinking, oh my God, what did I do? What did I say? I said, this is a safe space, you know, and I want you to feel that. And, and I think that also has, you know, been very helpful. In fact, I mean, one of the most memorable things is that after Hunting Ground came out, I got a letter in the mail from a woman and she said, you don't remember me and I'm not in the film, but I just want to say I saw Hunting Ground and I don't care that I wasn't in it because that interview with you was so amazing. You made me feel so heard and believed and that's all I needed to sort of move forward. So I do really think that we have a place as filmmakers to sort of help people work through these kind of traumas if we approach them with sort of the integrity and responsibility that we need to. That's really, um, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, Kirby, after you. Sorry, you're gonna have to no, unmute yourself. <laughs> Got it. Okay, um, I just wanted to say that, uh, just add to what Amy was saying is, one other thing that we bring to this is a great deal of experience and knowledge about the subject matter. And I think that's very important because when someone is describing um, an experience, th these, these subjects, and Amy is interviewing them, these subjects know that Amy understands the experience that they've gone through, that they're not having to justify their experience or explain the kind of psychological travails that they've gone over 10 or 20 or 30 years, and even the, uh, the difficulty of speaking about this at all. So I think that that, you know, having made three or four, two or three films in this arena helps us and really calms down the subjects and, and makes them feel like they're in good, safe hands. I think it's really, um, really 
heartening to hear you describe it in that way because the way uh, Drew and Salai and Sherry and all the other women who are interviewed in the film reveal their, their stories gradually over time, it, it, it's very clear that the interview process was not extractive. Um, it was it's not there to provide any kind of sensational, um, oh my God moment. It's, it's much more about creating a space for these women to be heard. Um, Drew, I don't know if you want to say any more to that. Well, I would say, I mean, I know your question was sort of about the beginning of the process and how survivors or interview subjects who are in vulnerable states of mind to begin with feel comfortable with filmmakers to sort of consent to the interview in the first place. But there's also the sort of long haul of working on a project over time. And one thing that I'm very grateful for is that Amy and Kirby understand the sort of anxiety that survivors have about who we can trust and whether or not we're being manipulated. I mean, that's exactly what happens when you're assaulted, especially when you're assaulted by someone powerful. And, you know, they didn't take it personally when I sort of had my misgivings and when I was really sort of going back and forth about whether I wanted to go on the record and whether I wanted to proceed with the project, whether or not I wanted to just retreat to my private life, whether or not it was too much for me to take, they really understood that's part of the process. And the more they sort of stood there, sort of just sort of stood in their place and held space for me to work through all of that without taking it personally or making me feel pressure really established the trust that I think not only led to the initial participation and the ongoing participation, but I also think the back and forth exchange we had about the underlying content of the film and how it really became so rich and intimate and powerful because they really created space for me to develop trust with them over time. Completely. Um, I also wanted to ask you, um, uh, and forgive my my directness in asking you this, what it felt like to kind of um, speak out as a as a black woman, but know that you were entrusting your story uh, to two white filmmakers who were who were going to facilitate you. I mean, I think that one of the ways the film kind of deals with this is by including a lot of voices of black women, a lot of brilliant black feminist scholars to contextualize and um, kind of help to give a little bit of um, framing to, to your stories. But I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, that relationship. Yes, that's a great question. I was very anxious and very clear from the beginning that I had misgivings and you know concerns about articulating this story and this journey with white filmmakers who were not part of the community and might not even be under who might not even understand the intensity of the issues that we were taking on in this project and they listened to that, they responded to that, they were curious about that, frankly, and that informed not only their decision to enlist the voices of experts, the women that you see, these brilliant scholars that you see in the film, but also to get a really prominent, really powerful Black producer involved as early on as possible, which is what they did, and which is why I felt so comfortable when they told me a year ago, actually, that Oprah Winfrey was the executive producer. So they, I told them that that was a concern. They responded in front of the camera and behind the camera in every possible way to mitigate that concern, which is part of what reinforced the level of trust that I had and have in them. And it was a concern, in fairness, it was a concern of ours. I mean, pre-Drew, um, when, we, when we set out to make this, I don't know if you know the backstory, Simran, but it was a series, it was 
I, as I said, I was collecting a lot of, we were collecting a lot of stories from women in different industries. And then we cut together small clips. We started pitching it. And one of the people we pitched it to was Ms. Winfrey. She saw the clips, blew her mind. And she said, this has to be my first series for Apple. And we said, fantastic. And we started closely collaborating together. And in the course of making that series, which she named Toxic Labor, we approached her, I think June, so is it a year ago? I don't even know, time's a blur. Kirby, you're muted, so you can't correct me for once. It's true, um, true. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and said, look, you know, we're working on this episode on entertainment that you wanted the, in the series, but I keep, the, the, the material that we have around Drew is so mind blowing. Can we just show you this rough cut? We think it's really good and we think it's really important the way it unpacks you know, the, the way that this, that gender violence, di uh, uh, you know, affects women of color differently in a really, you know, a way that's really important for us to show and do justice to finally in the media. And so we showed her the rough cut and <clears throat> she, she first was reluctant and then she watched it and was like, oh my God, I see it. Absolutely. We have to make this its own entity. Maybe it'll be the first episode. Maybe it'll be a film. Let's just keep working on it together. And then we really worked with her in earnest for six to seven months. Oprah saw multiple cuts. So at that point, I want to just make clear, we knew we were white, but we also were very closely collaborating with, you know, an extremely important voice in, in Black, you know, culture and Black entertainment and, you know, a remarkable producer. I mean, brilliant mind. And that really was, it was this really collaborative effort and the film would not be what it is today without Oprah greenlighting it, giving it her support, her vision and fully collaborating. So it, it is that kind of hybrid effort. Um, I'm really interested to know a little bit more about how you chose the, the brilliant women um, kind of commentators in the film, because you have some real powerhouses. I mean, Kiana Mayo, an absolute legend, um, Michelle Wallace, Kimberly Crenshaw. I mean, these are all the kind of black feminist scholars that I read at a very formative time, kind of in this non-academic space, talking in a language that, you know, everybody can understand. Um, how did you, how did you come up with who to speak to? Kirby, do you want to go with that? Sure, sure. Yeah, it was a, it was kind of a range of, uh, uh, influences, if you will. Uh, I mean, first of all, Drew. I mean, Drew had people to suggest, um, and and right from the beginning, that was very helpful. Um, I think we'd already, or maybe perhaps on that same trip, you'd already interviewed uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, um, because again, as Amy said, this was part of a larger project, and we felt her perspective on anything in this arena really, we really needed her perspective. And then um, as we were making the film, you know, every person we came in contact, we would ask who else would be good to speak uh, uh, in the film. And also we did our own research. So it was a, a process where we were continually researching, investigating, asking for um, recommendations over the course of a year or probably even 18 months. So um, I, um... I mean, we were very fortunate to have these people all be a part of the project. And that's something we do for on all films. We we use everyone in the film as consultants. You know, we ask them for tips. Who else should we talk to? What did we miss? What might we be missing? So that's an important point. And I also just want to give out to, a shout out to Kirby. Kirby becomes an absolute expert on any field that we're ever involved in. Like now he knows more about medical devices, I think, than probably anyone in the history of mankind. But my most, the most amusing moment of making on the record was him walking around with Def Jam books and like the history of hip hop. I mean, look at him. It was very amusing in the office and he was totally into it and interested and like, and that was sort of very amusing. So it, it comes from a lot of rigorous, honestly, rigorous research, um, the help of amazing, you know, people like, like Drew, who, you know, we relied on throughout and, and our own just desire to really master a field in a certain way, as attempt to really understand it and then, you know, put it forward with as much responsibility as possible. I'm really, I've spoken about, spoken about this with Drew before, but I'm really interested in this thing that the movie does where it kind of examines the personal cost of speaking out and also of the, you know, horrendous abuse that all of these survivors have 
had to endure, but it also flips the question around and asks, what is the cost or what is the loss to the culture when these women are no longer welcome in certain spaces? Um, Drew, I, I'd really like to hear a little bit from you about the kind of professional aspect uh, of, of loss and the kind of cultural aspect of, of what happened to you and, and kind of how you felt about going into that stuff um, on the record in the film. In some ways, the professional loss is the part that is still the hardest for me. I knew that I had to deal with the sexual assault and the violence in my therapy. So I've been working on that for many years. It never really occurred to me until I started revisiting my story in depth in the film that I was avoiding the pain that I still have about that part of the cost and that price. And even throughout the filming process, Amy and Kirby kept asking me, do you have any plaques or pictures or any mementos from that part of your life? And I kept blowing them off actually. Like I just really didn't want to deal with that. And then finally in November, literally, I, I realized it was important and I went to a storage unit that I hadn't been to for like a decade. And I got the, you know, the Platinum Santana record and the Aretha Franklin plaque and the show soundtrack plaque. And, you know, that's really painful for me. I, you know, I, I actually have also gotten messages from people who've seen the film who I knew in the industry as managers or lawyers who used to bring demos to me, who told me that once I left the industry, there was no longer anyone to bring certain kinds of artists and projects to because I filled a particular space and I had a particular point of view that was missing. And that's devastating to me. I think about the artists that didn't have a place to go. And I also think about the executives that I could have nurtured. I have an intern who is now a vice president of a and at RCA Records. And I think about how many more people could I have helped. And so that's still something I think I'm grieving. Yeah. And if I can just add to that, because people say, what's different about this film than your other films? I think for the big, when I did that, when we did that series of interviews with women from all different industries, that was a real aha moment for me where I realized, you know, I'm a 70s feminist and the rhetoric then was glass ceiling, you know, you know, sexism keeps women down. They just don't hire women and they don't pay them equal. But what never occurred to me actually was that, no, it's not just that, it's that women also, or that women leave because of children, right? Those are the two things we were told. You leave to have your babies or you, you're pressured out because you know men just don't respect women and whatever, it's a sexist culture. But the revelation in doing those interviews was, oh no, actually, so we lose so many women who self-exile due to sexual trauma, violence, and harassment. We don't even know that. You know, they don't even know it. Like Drew even said that, you know, I remember interviewing her. She was like, the narrative she told herself was, oh, I just don't like music much, I guess. I mean, like, <laughs> so that kind of insanity. Now imagine that multiplied over decades, multiplied over tens of hundreds of thousands of women, right? Exiling all of these industries. And what do we lose? You know, we lose their, in, you know, all of what they would have created, all of the people, as Drew said, they would have mentored, all of that cultural capital, all of the songs Drew might have, you know, put together. And we lost that for generations now, which leaves us with, you know, Marvel comics as are the apex of entertainment ad nauseum, you know, at, you know, on repeat. So that's a huge, you know, here we are. So, you know, that's this invisible woman, this missing woman, I think is a really potent thing that it come, you know, is it, we sort of explore in the film and, and is really tragic. And I do hope that when people watch the film, you know, that's something that we all leave with and think about and, and figure out like, oh, we can't afford that loss anymore. Completely. Um, and I, I wonder sort of on that point, um, you say that was one of the ways that this film diverged from your previous two films. Um, but I thought perhaps that it might be good to talk a little bit about how, although, you know, this is a theme that you've been exploring in your work about these systems of sexual abuse um, in, in the military and on college campuses and, and now in the entertainment industry, 
I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about how this film kind of fits into the broader scope of, of your work in a more kind of general sense. Well, one of the things um, I, I would like to say is, you know, this is our third, actually our fourth film. Uh, we also made a film our, on um, sexual assault of, by priests um, in uh, 2005. Um, and, and what's interesting is every time we go back into this subject, we, have a, we ask ourselves, should we do this again? Or are we just repeating ourselves? But in fact, we're, each time we go in, we find ourselves learning more, going deeper, understanding it more. And, um, and so it's, it's really a rich experience for us. And, and of course, where do we learn from? We really learn, we learn from experts, of course, but we really learn from the survivors because they're the, they're the people who have really experienced this and not only their personal experience, but their analytic, their, their analysis of this as well, because they've had a chance to think about it for 10, 20, 30 years. Um, and, and oftentimes they've, they've been thinking about it daily. So just the opportunity to work with these, you know, brilliant people, survivors, courageous people, brings us a kind of a, a deeper, brings to us, a, uh, well, allows us to gain a deeper level of understanding. And I think when we came to On the Record, the opportunity for us was to focus on one particular, on, on several uh, particular people's experience rather than look at more of the broader systemic issues. Although of course, you know, you can see a systemic problem in On the Record. We were very interested in particular in Drew's experience, not only the decision to come forward, but what happens afterwards? What happens the day of, the day after, weeks, months, and you know, even nearly a year later, what, or a couple of years later, actually, what that experience is like? Because often, what you what you see when people report, or when when uh, you know uh, a publication reports on um, a survivor coming forward, that's the end of the story that is told. But the story for the survivor continues, and. That is an experience that we knew from making previous films, but this time we had the opportunity to actually show what happens after someone comes forward and goes on the record. And, and uh, yeah, ex and just to add a little bit to what, what Kirby said, what's so interesting to us is that when we started, we started working together in this space, it was like 2008, Kirby? Uh, no, not 2019, no. Okay, give me the year. Uh, 2007. Two, oh, oh, this, you know, 2010, right. Yes. But, we, but it was before we started making, oh. but we started actually looking into the military and sexual assault in 2008, right? Yes, correct. Okay, so back then, just so when everyone's sort of Eeyore about like the state of things, which is so easy to be, and things change is impossible. I mean, literally in 2010, we could not get anyone interested in, funding a film on sexual assault in the military. We were told people don't care about women's stories. This is 2010. This is from leftist and right, you know, distributing platforms. People don't care about women's stories. People don't care about women being raped and people certainly don't care about women being raped in the military. And that was across the board. We just took our own money, went around the country, just me and Kirby, no crew filming women in the military. And that ended up being Invisible War. Cut to Me Too happens, Kirby calls me and says, can you believe two years ago, our big talking point for hunting ground was believe women. And that was like a boulder. You know, we had to like say that at every media thing, at every Q and A, like just believe, like what's the takeaway, believe women and hammer that because that was so like revelatory to people. Oh, these crimes happen and women aren't making it up. And so that, and then Me Too happens. And so the good news is, you know, here we are, there's a lot of films out there. Thank, you know, props to everybody working in the space now. There's funding, there's interest, and, and the needle has shifted. And as you said, what do we get to do now in these films? We get to go deeper and richer. We're not just having the bar, you know, the bar, we can do this much more sophisticated and nuanced account of the ways in which black women are in quadruple jeopardy when it comes to sexual assault. I mean, you think, you think it's difficult for survivors? Well, look what happens if you're a person of color and all the other hurdles you have to contend with when you're assaulted by, you know, when you're afflicted by these crimes. So that's what we got to do with On the Record and that's what we hope to do in some other projects we now have brewing to sort of, you know, dive deeper. I'm interested in something that Kirby said just now about sort of wanting to go beyond the moment of reportage and kind of dropping the bomb of this thing happened uh, and kind of finding out the next stages of the story. And I guess the natural 
sort of follow-up question is what does justice look like for survivors? What does justice look like for the women who have suffered this? Um, in my intro, I, I mentioned that, you know, your films have resulted in the passage of laws and congressional hearings and products being pulled from the marketplace. Um, obviously, the film has only just come out and it's come out in a very sort of unusual and complex moment, um, both in a global pandemic and also in the middle of um, upheaval for black liberation. Um, but I'm interested to know whether you've started to see some justice as a result of the film um, uh, and, and what that looks like to, to all three of you really. Well, I would say that one sort of substantive change that I think could make a difference is the statute of limitations just being expanded to be indefinite for survivors of sexual violence. It is indescribably difficult to heal and to put yourself back together again after you are raped. Really the least productive thing, thing I think you can do for your healing is to then interact with the criminal justice system, especially as a black woman. That is the least hospitable venue I can possibly imagine. And so for me, I focused on healing, on dusting myself off, on trying to restart my career at a new company. And I actually did that with some success and then was harassed again, having done no therapy on the rape, which is why I think in some ways that was so devastating to me so quickly. But another thing that I think is really important with respect to what Amy and Kirby were saying about widening the lens with this film to look at not just the revelation, but the impact of the revelation is so true because in my case, I really did believe that when I told my story, I would sort of be depositing this information in the public square. And then I would go back to my private life and continue where I left off. And I didn't understand that the existence of that information in the public square would change my relationship to that information and that it would be there would be a feedback loop and it would change the way I saw myself in the world and it wasn't even until after I read the New York Times article that I realized that the whole entire thing had been a trap and there was probably never a demo for those who've seen the film and so I had to still 22 years later continue to metabolize the experience of having been raped and the rape of my career as well. And that is ongoing and really has to take precedence for me as a responsible adult woman in the world before I then reflect on what should or shouldn't happen to Russell Simmons in the context of the criminal justice system. So. I just think the statute of limitations should be expanded and frankly be indefinite for survivors of rape because it's just, it's, it's not something that happens and then you're done. It's something that really unfolds for the rest of your life. I thought you were looking like you were going to say something, Amy. But you were <laughs> Well, I totally agree with Drew on a, you know, absolutely on a legislative level, but I also want to just, again, justice looks like this, like it's a miracle. We're all talking about this issue. We're not being censored. You're giving it a platform. It's getting recognized. It, HBO Max decided to put it on the air. These voices are finally being heard and validated. And I really do believe that on a micro level, like this one-on-one -on -one watching a film, consciousness changing, making everybody kind of internalize how to be better, you know, not, not participate in racist economies anymore, you know, on any level and be much more aware of that. That's justice. If we can all move forward, you know, and, and, and commit after seeing this film or before, you know, in, in whatever way to sort of expanding our consciousness and not allowing, you know, these ecosystems that put this pressure on black women that is so unfair and unjust to continue to exist, that will be justice ultimately and is justice even in the moment. I, I would say that is very true. And, you know, living in a world where I had to accommodate Russell as this hero, 
made me small every single day of my life following the rape. And by telling the story in such a rich and powerful way, Amy and Kirby and Oprah Winfrey sort of tore down my living, breathing Confederate statue that was just an insult and an affront to me and to the other survivors in this film. And that changes the world for me and all of us in a way that is almost impossible to put into words. I think putting it into, into those words and describing it as a Confederate statue being drawn down is, is a pretty articulate way of putting it. Um, I think that, you know, one of the things that the film does so well is to not make it about the perpetrator. Um, the perpetrator exists. Uh, as I, when I spoke to Salai last week, Salai Abrams, she was explaining how the context as a survivor changes when your perpetrator is famous and you get a sense of the impact of that. But this film does not center Russell Simmons. It's not his story. It's your story, Drew. It's Salai's story. It's Sherry's story. Um, I'm noticing not many questions in the Q&A section. So if anybody is feeling shy, there is a little bit of time to, to kind of type those in. Um, but I thought maybe sort of as we're coming towards the end of the conversation, um, we'd maybe have a think about what it feels like to have the film come out in this particular moment. Um, as I said, it's a moment of, of upheaval and uh, you know, about black liberation, the Black Lives Matter moment is something that is touching everybody's lives right now. And this is a story about the experiences of black women. Um, and I, I wonder if the three of you have been reflecting on, on how those two things are colliding right now. I think about it a lot. The erasure of the sexual violence perpetrated against black women and girls is inherently racist. It's rooted in the Atlantic slave trade. Black women were systematically raped by the slave traders, not even just by the slave owners, but by the slave traders before they even boarded the boat to cross the Atlantic to be sold into slavery because it was actually ec economically advantageous to rape a black woman because you could produce an additional asset in the form of an enslaved child. That is a history that no other group of women have endured for the, over the course of hundreds of years, the way black women have. And in addition to that, while that crime was being perpetrated again and again against the bodies of black women, black men were, and this is something I talk about in the film, in Ghana, in the slave castle where the enslaved people were held, Black men who attempted to defend the women who were being raped were put into a cell called the condemned cell and they were left there to die. And so the breakdown of the dynamic between Black men and women and the way in which Black men were disempowered in terms of their ability to protect, not only to protect Black women, but to even see what was happening to us is literally playing itself out again today. And I'm hoping that as we have found the courage in this moment to face the systemic nature of racism, not just you're hurting my feelings racism, but there is a structural disadvantage with real life and death consequences for black people that comes from this culture and these dynamics. While we are looking at it, while we have the courage, let's also look at the ways in which that structure has uniquely harmed black women in the broader community and within the black community. And so, yes, I think this film really is perfect for this moment. Kirby and Amy, I don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit as well. Well, obviously it's been hugely on our minds. I mean, you know, um, but I see it as a real opportunity, you know, and it's a, you know, there's a crack in the universe right now where people are actually 
soul searching and truly reflecting on, you know, that white people are reflecting on their complicity and, and really kind of finally hearing and listening to the voices of people of color. And, you know, obviously black people are finally feeling like something might be different. People are listening and I just, I'm grateful our film is landing where people have a space and a ability and a kind of common vulnerability due to COVID that they might be open to sort of really empathizing truly with someone else's trauma and difficulty and that our film might help in that way for people to evolve on their road of consciousness and actually help women's voices be more elevated, supported, and endorsed. I mean, yeah, I, I you know, for all the horror that everyone is going through, the, you know, the silver lining has been in that it's given people a moment to really contemplate on racial oppression in a way that our society our globally never has. So in that way, I'm, you know, COVID's given a space for that and that's a silver lining. And I think as Drew said, the film really helps helps articulate something that hasn't been articulated in the mainstream ever and is long overdue, centuries overdue. Um, I, I have a question that's come through. Um, it's a sensitive question, so I'm, I'm not going to read the person's name. Um, but they've said, how would you recommend voicing concerns of abusive people to employers and companies? I'm specifically asking because I've been sexually assaulted by people in the industry and I have friends who have as well. I then had to work with these people in rehearsal rooms or shoots, and I felt that I didn't have a leg to stand on, especially when working with those that had assaulted friends, as it wasn't my own experience, but I was very triggered working with them. Um, that's a, a really difficult question, but given the kind of resource of having the three of you here who have kind of been able to articulate these experiences or, or, or facilitate the articulation of these experiences, perhaps, Perhaps you have something to offer this person. Wow, I was hoping Amy or Kirby might have something. I, I was, you know, I would just say, first of all, I'm so sorry that happened to you. And I am proud of you and grateful to you for your courage in speaking out in this forum and asking for help, because that's actually a huge hurdle that's sort of invisible. I think a lot of people take that first step for granted and that's actually in some ways the hardest step is admitting that this really bad thing happened because you get very gaslit often and you normalize this behavior. And so I'm grateful that you are acknowledging that it that you were harmed and asking for help. Um, you know, I I don't know it's I don't know, I mean there's there's obviously there's there's organizations that that you can turn to. Um, I've told people who are experiencing inappropriate behavior to email themselves. I know that sounds really weird, but to, to track sort of how far from your kind of north set point you are moved as behavior becomes increasingly egregious. It sounds like you may already be very clear that you're way far from your set point. Um, so I don't know. I, does anyone have something to suggest? Well, I would just, you know, add to that. I mean, if 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 this this is your choice, of course, but I think it's helpful not to do this alone. I think it's very important to, as Drew said, go to a survivor organization, go to a therapist, <clears throat> and get support, even as you're taking whatever step you're taking, <clears throat> because this is a very overwhelming experience. And, um, and, and, and there's going to be many difficult steps. And, um, and that's in a therapist or a survival organization, someone that you can talk to in advance and, and ex kind of explain the whole, as, com as, as much as you feel comfortable, explain the situation and have them by your side, I think is very, very important. I, I wanna also, yes, Kirby's absolutely right, because one thing that I found is that there are two different jobs that you need to do to move on. One is to survive and the other one is to heal. And they actually call for, in some ways, inverse responses. So while you're busy surviving, pushing it down, you know, keeping 
it moving, dusting yourself off, everything that you have to summon to survive may be the opposite of what you have to do to heal. And so you may need, in fact, you do need some external resource who may help you find your own internal resources, but a therapist or a friend until you can get to a therapist to make sure that you're healing and you're committing to that work and journey for yourself, for your long-term health, as well as doing whatever you have to do in the moment, which may be in some ways dissociating and talking yourself out of just how painful it was to get through the day. So yes, I think it's very important to find someone, even if it's not the ultimate resource that's gonna turn it all around for you in the near term to talk to, to keep an eye on you, to make sure that you do that work at some point for your own sake. Thank you, Drew, um, and also Kirby. I think documentaries like this are a real resource for, for people and, um, and you speaking out about your experiences sets a precedent for other people who may not have had the courage to um, speak out about what's happened to them and uh, and the work that Amy and Kirby do in, in kind of facilitating that I think is very uh, very important and very needed. Um, I think that's about all we've got time for but I just wanted to thank the three of you so much for, for joining me and being so generous and open with your answers. Um, the film, I'm, as I said at the beginning, I'm sure you've all seen it, it's been available on the BAFTA portal but um, it comes out on general release here in the UK on Friday. Um, and it would be great if you were as moved by the film as I was to, to sort of spread the word about it. Um, but yeah, thank you everybody. Thank you, yeah, do, do spread the word. Watching the film is a political act and the more yeah. people that watch it, the more support will go to filmmakers and that make these kind of investigative films, so thank you. I can speak for many of my friends, black women are very, very concerned that we are being lost in this struggle for black liberation. And it really is an, a political act to take 95 minutes and watch this film. It's a glimpse into a 400 year history of the oppression of black women. And I am hopeful that we will be seen in this moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, BAPTA. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. Bye. <laughs> uh...